Rest in peace to Chico. 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 Today, with various agencies, but most important, importantly, we have the youth out here that's standing together, that's actually here to reduce some of the gun violence and the violence that's going on. We need to break down these barriers between the police department and the community. They're scared to talk to us. I don't want them to be scared of us. We don't want the youth to be scared of the police department. It does take a village, and, and we're part of that village. We spend more times in your, more time in your communities than we spend at home. So we want to be a part of your community. Lord, Father God, let's pray for the families that lost loved ones out here. Let's pray for the family that lost this young 16-year-old young brother. Do not let this march be in vain. Let the people that need to be helped be helped. And Father God, we know that there's something better than saving a dollar. Lord, Father God, we just ask that we continue to know that saving a life is way better. Increase the peace! Not now, then at least sometime soon. Because I'm ready for our youth to grow up in a safe and stable environment. Thank you, Michael, for joining me. But before we get started, can you introduce who you brought with us to, with yeah. you today? Thanks for having me. Um, so here I brought Aaron Todd, who is a current Youth Bill student, class of 2015 and 16. Um, he was a part of the Peace Walk, and um, he actually brought MNN and the Youth Channel, ne youth Channel Network over to our Peace Walk, and I got Jude Wilson with me here too, who's also a youth bill student, and he was also influential in the Peace Walk also. All right, well, thank you for joining me today. No thank you for having us. <coughs> okay, Michael. Mm -hmm. Days after Chico's death, another man was shot in Jefferson Housing Projects. Thankfully, this man lived, but my question is, how, mm -hmm. does, how do you feel about the violence in Harlem communities? Well, you know, first and foremost, me being a father of three young boys, I have a 10-year-old, a 7-year-old, and a 5-year-old, it kind of gave me a sense of worry because, you know, I'm always concerned about what environment I'm going to leave my kids in. And, you know, me being a young person that was born and raised in the housing projects, particularly Wagner, I was able to grow up safe because my community, even though we had drugs and poverty going on, people kind of had a caring sense of the community. And um, my goal is to try to bring that back you know, mm -hmm. um, first and foremost by being a dean in the community that I live in. And I think the second thing was being able to assist my students when they're hurting or they're feeling some type of sense of loss or pain when one of their peers are getting shot. So um, I feel like, you know, this Peace Walk was one of the ways that we can kind of bring a sense of awareness to our community or at least start the process of us caring about our community. Okay, well, thank you no so problem. much. Um, how do you... How did this whole Jeff versus Wagner, East River versus Jeff come about? Honestly speaking, um, I think it's about nothing. I think it's about pride. I think it's about our young people not having the proper resources in the community where they can kind of put that energy and that frustration to. Um, I think that it's more of our elected officials and a bunch of other people not really putting the focus on the community as the way that they should, in particular, at-risk young people ages 16 to 24, which they call like now disadvantaged young people. Mm -hmm. um, back when I was younger, we had the Beacon Center, we had the Boys mm -hmm. Club, we had a lot of community centers where as soon as I got out of school to about eight o'clock at night, my time was occupied by just activities and working on the computer, homework help and things like that. Where right now, when a young person leaves school, if they even go to school, there's nothing available for them. There might be things available for their little brothers and sisters, but when you get to the age of ninth grade, the only option you have now is to go home, play PlayStation, or yeah, search the music. internet, listen to music, or hang out with people that want to get into trouble. 
Okay, um, do you think that the same thing that's going on in Harlem um, happens in other communities? Absolutely. Um, I think what's going on in Harlem right now is that it's being magnified because this young person got killed and mm -hmm. they're starting to see retaliation between the other pro surrounding projects. But I think it's just bigger than um, young Chico being killed. I think that that was just the example that a lot of the young people use to express their frustration. But um, I do think that it's going on nationwide. I mean, you can look at Chicago, mm -hmm. you can look at Louisiana, you know, they might even actually have it worse than what we have. But mm -hmm. I think the most important thing for us is to try to slow this <coughs> down and bring a sense of uh, awareness to this issue right now so that we don't turn into those other cities. Um, so the difference in when you grew up mm -hmm. and how it is now, like, how do you think? I think I will, I think some of the parents are afraid. Mm -hmm. I think some of them are frustrated because it's really hard for you to focus on whether your child or your, your son or daughter is going to school or doing what they need to do when you're trying to put food on the table, when you're trying to look for work or you're frustrated because you lost your job or you're trying to take care of um, situations that are beyond your control like housing and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of the reason why these problems actually surfaced was that a lot of the resources that was needed in our community have been slowly pulled away or we probably didn't do a good job of taking care of those resources when we had them or not being educated enough on the resources that we have. And I think the outcome of that is a lot of young people were forced to raise themselves with no sense of connectivity or sense of connection to family. You know, family is something that has slowly started to escape our daily sense of living in our community. Yes. So, um, the protest, which are pro do you think that that could change? Is that starting to change? Well, you know, how the Peace Walk started, right? And, you know, I kind of get really nervous when people use the word protest because, okay, so no, 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 I'm going to tell yeah, you why. I understand. When people use protest, people always think that, you know, we're fighting against something. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't the point of what we did. What we wanted to do was bring a sense of awareness and a sense of togetherness of these neighborhoods all belong to us. And, you know, for me to have young people from Wagner walking to Jeff, from young people from Jefferson walking into Johnson and, and the likes of that nature, just broke the ice of, as a supportive network of caring young adults, that we shouldn't be afraid to walk into the communities where we all have the same stake and we all care about the same things. So I do think that the Peace Walk, to answer your question, does solve one problem, and the first problem is, do we care? And I think that's, that's the first thing that we needed to establish <laughs> is that these young adults care about their community and us as being caring, older, supportive adults should support them in whatever they want to do. Okay, well, um, I wanted to also add, because I'm from Wagner also, cool. and um, I walk back and forth from Wagner. I walk through Jeff and Johnson, mm -hmm. and I feel a little, you know, ease because of the, you said yeah. you don't like protests, so walk. Walk. So, like, Peace walk, yeah. Peace march. Peace march. So, like, I thank you for that. No problem. Because it no gave problem. me the strength to stand up for my for my nephews, too. Thank you. So, thank you. And I thank mean, you. I thank you for <coughs> bringing your team out there because, mm -hmm. you know, yes, Channel 7 did come out and did a piece of media, but it was mm -hmm. what you guys did as young people bringing the resources that that was able <coughs> People that didn't have the courage or the trust to see it mm -hmm. So what the great thing that that outcome was. And um, so I want to thank you guys, too, for just coming out and supporting. All right, no problem. Well, I want to direct my attention to the youth. Got it. So um, how do you feel about walking in your neighborhood, Aaron? Well, in my neighborhood, I feel safe, you know, because these mm -hmm. are people that, yes, these are people that I grew up with, you know. So certain times in the night, you know, it does get a little spooky, you know. But, I mean, at the end of the day, that's home. Now, other neighborhoods, mm. it's, a little, it's, a little, it's a little different, you know, because you never, nowadays, walking in these streets, you never know what can happen. They might think you're from somewhere. Mm -hmm. They might think y'all have beef, boom. Situation might um, occur. Why do you think that young men have it so hard to walk into another neighborhood that they're not from? Um, just like what Mike said, it's about pride. Nowadays, people take pride, they take pride too serious. Like, you know, if, if you can't talk it out, then the situation doesn't have to escalate from there. You should be, as, as young adults and as young men, especially as young African-American men, African -American men in this society, 
We should be able to talk our, our, our situations out. Okay. We shouldn't have to resort to violence all the time because that's what they expect us to do. That's, that's change. Um, that and change starts with, um, with how yourself. How do you feel about walking around in your neighborhood? I feel fairly safe, you know. As he said, it gets a little spooky at night sometimes. But that's the neighborhood, that's home, you know. Mm -hmm. I get scared when I go somewhere else and in the middle of nowhere. You know, I go out in the woods. <laughs> but um, but now I feel perfectly safe in my neighborhood. I know everybody in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. It's my home. East home is my home. It's my town. Okay, so um, in the video, the law enforcement said we don't want our youth to be scared of the police department. What are your thoughts on that? The law enforcement, they have... Because of the situations that occurred within the past, what was it, two to three years? Mm -hmm. the past two to three years, you know, law enforcement all around the nation has a very bad image on their name, you know, but there's a lot of good cops out there, you know, and there's also a lot of bad cops out there. It's all about, like I said, change starts with you. So you get into an encounter with an officer, you just got to be respectful, follow, follow their questions, their actual questions, show them respect, answer it. And then nine times out of ten, they'll let you go about your business. So, what about you? I agree with, with um, what Aaron says. There, I, th I think there's more good cops than bad cops. Mm -hmm. I think bad cops have a bit of an ego problem. Mm -hmm. you know? um, Michael, I want to ask you the same question, even though you're not a youth. You know? We're caring young adult. Okay, so young <laughs> adult. <laughs> He's 34 so, years um, young. Do you think, why do you think that the youth are so scared of the police? I think that it's a stigma that they're raised with. Mm -hmm. You know, I think when I was a kid, I was told not to talk to police. Police are mm -hmm. bad. You're a black man. You don't talk to police. And I'm pretty sure that there was some good examples during the early 80s when I was born that made my grandmother tell me those things. Mm -hmm. But, you know, one of the things that was so impressive about this peace walk that we had, the young people came to me on Monday saying that they wanted to do something about this young person being killed. It was my job to use the resources that I know between the NYPD, um, which played a major role in the Peace Walk, and our elected officials to make this walk happen on Saturday. And what the NYPD did was they put all of their resources in the community, the 23rd, the 25th, and PSA 5, to support us in this walk. Mm -hmm. Their main objective was to make sure that we were safe during this walk and to support us during this walk. So, you know, that definitely allowed me to believe stronger and more, uh, I guess on a positive note, that you know, NYPD do want to make a change in, their com in our communities and things of that nature. And you know, Captain Gurley said at the march, you know, they understand that they have this bad reputation and they're trying to change it. And mm -hmm. I think that by them supporting mm -hmm. young people mm -hmm. and coming through was one of the greatest first steps that they could have did because we didn't have a permit. Mm -hmm. We didn't ask for any, we didn't do the proper procedures in order to do a, a march. And not only did they assist us and join us, they actually let us use the bullhorns and stuff of that nature to mm. amplify sound and stay out there with us. So, you know, those are like the small stories that people don't know, mm -hmm. you know, and I think <coughs> that's the stories that should be told. And we should, I guess, do a better job of um, publicizing the good relationships that are happening and some of the samples that we're having in our community of how police, young people, and, and, and older people are working together to make our community better. Um, to piggyback on this question, I noticed when we were doing the walk, um, some of Chico's friends mm -hmm. were like um, around when we were walking through Wagner. Mm -hmm. And do you think they didn't join us because of the police? I think they didn't join us because they were still in the state of mourning. Mm -hmm. I think they didn't know what to expect from that. I do think that when they see young people, white people, black people, and police walking together, they didn't know how to approach that. Mm -hmm. But I also think that that goes back to them not having the information and just not knowing what's the right way to fight for something that you believe in. You know, there's no way that we're going to live our lives ignoring police or considering them the enemy. Like, it's just not going to happen. And I think the sooner we're able to kind of get that mess out of our brains and our live livelihood and our upbringing, it'll make us go a lot further. Um, again, like, you know, do I think that we should trust every single police officer that out there? No, but should we give them the benefit of the doubt? Yeah. Okay, um, Aaron, same question. Do you think that his friends were afraid of the cop? That's why they joined the march? I don't feel like they were afraid of the cops. I just feel like they, there's a lot of people out here that believe like 
One Piece marches are going to do anything. Mm-hmm. Like, there, there was a time where they shut down the whole, it was Willis Avenue Bridge, right? Mm-hmm. Shut down the whole Willis Avenue Bridge. Black for the Lives police. Matter. Black Lives Matter, the people that were with us. Shut down the whole Willis Avenue Bridge and wasn't much of a change. So they probably, they're already in a state of mind where it's like, all right, y'all doing the peace march, but nothing's going to happen. And that's the state of mind that this community is in that is really nothing going to happen. You have to be able to figure out how you're going to do this, how you're going to go about it. What do you want to change? And then once you figure that out, then you can initiate it, then you can execute. Okay, so my last question is, um, what um, is the role in, so what role does social media play in a big part of these young kids' lives? That's for Aaron, for me, for Jew. It's for anybody who want to answer. Social media is basically like, for young people, it's the urban news. Mm-hmm. It that's exactly. that's that's the urban eyewitness right there. Yes. New York hood. <laughs> <laughs> Put it I mean that that's as real as it gets. Like you wanna find something out that happened in the community, go to mm-hmm. Facebook. Mm-hmm. You wanna know about the most popping party for the weekend, go to Instagram. Mm-hmm. You wanna figure out what's going on in Empire, check Twitter. <laughs> you know? That's true. So yeah, so better than what I was gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so, so yeah, so social media, you know. For for all the non-political and high-scale situations like that, you go to social media. I mean, even when, um, so the day that walk happened, I went home and like I was all nostalgic and full of hope and pride, mm-hmm. right? You know, I, I think a lot of us was. And I go on social media and somebody from Wagner Houses videotaped us walking yeah, through the project. Yeah, I saw it, mm-hmm. yes. That joint got shared like 50,000 yes, times. I was like, whoa, like. So that's the power of social media. Like, mm-hmm. you know, um, I didn't know Chico's family directly, mm-hmm. but I saw a message that his sister said, and they're like, you know, they love my brother. Like, you know, this kind of helped them go through this mourning period that complete strangers that didn't know this young man mm-hmm. came through in honor of not only him, but just like, you know, in honor of all the young people or just people in general that died of gun violence. So, so social sh- give people a sense of hope. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, like, social media was so big because I reached out to our counsel, Melissa Martha Verito, via mm-hmm. Twitter. Um, and I just kept doing it, kept doing it, kept doing it, became a pest about it. Um, posting the flyers and, you know, a lot of key stakeholders started retweeting the flyer. Like Lisa Evers from Fox 5 retweeted it and um, the councilwoman did and the New York City Council started retweeting it. And, you know, National Action Network from um, Reverend Al Sharpton, they retweeted it. Mm. So, you know, like word of mouth that when you've seen all of those people, they may not have known Chico or us, you mm. filled or you guys directly, but... They heard about it, and you know I think social media was a huge advocate to just get this word out. Um, what about the music? What do you mean? Oh, shoot. Do you think music plays a big role? Perhaps. Yeah. That's for them. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, you know, turn it up? I mean, I'm a J Cole guy. J Cole, I never Kendrick. Did this before. Yeah. You know, turn it up. You know, but <laughs> I don't say what type of music I listen to. This is not for this type of interview. So, Jude, what do you listen to? I like, listen to... Just like, do y'all think that the music that's out right now... Oh, yeah, now, yes. Most the definitely. music definitely has an effect on the on the community and society itself. You know? Yeah. I mean, when you have Chief Keef with his raindrop dreadlocks just running <laughs> around... <laughs> he got the dirt. With a gun in somebody's face, you know, in front of the camera, and just basically, as Reverend Al Sharpton said, maybe you're yelling, shoot, in a crowded theater. Mm-hmm. So... That's basically what these kids are listening to. You know, just everyone just having the same story about killing somebody or selling some drugs, mm-hmm. and it's not, you know, having a good effect on that. You know, I, I think, so when I reached out to a bunch of people, I reached out to Power 105, I reached out to Hot 97, just to see if we can get 30 seconds of air time talking about what we're trying to do. Mm-hmm. Nobody responded back to us, you know, and I'm not sure if it's because they get those type of inquiries all the time, mm-hmm. But I do think that music and media play a major part in the message that's going around. You know, um, when Officer Holden in East Harlem got killed by the pill over there, mm-hmm. the NYPD shut down that whole yes. area. Like I it was like we, like we were in that building. And you I know, home from work what I put on that. my social media was, you guys had no problem shutting down our neighborhood when the officer got killed. Mm-hmm. And you guys came out in droves for a police officer. This 16-year-old boy gets killed on Easter weekend, and it's like a blip on the news. Yeah. Y'all better come out for this, because we're the ones that vote. Like, these are the young people that are newly elect, newly registered voters, and if you want them to be invested in our democracy, 
then you need to come out for things matters that we care about. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was like the first test of these young people showing their power and just people just coming out and supporting them. They want us to speak up for ourselves but not give us an ear to listen, you know? And that's crazy. And because um, I do music also, so I'm trying to like change my lyrics mm -hmm. because like, believe it or not, kids really do listen to you because I have a little niece, an mm -hmm. eight-year-old niece, and she wants to be just like me. Mm -hmm. And she wants to be a rapper. And the words, the lyrics that I say that mm -hmm. she not supposed to be listening to, <laughs> and I got to change it because these kids listen to right. everything. And it's like a status. Like, they want to have the nice, the flyest shoes, nice right, pants, right, 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 get right, right. money, right. all it is. And it's, that's not what life is. Right. And that's, what's, uh, that's what I think is real right, with right, today's right. youth. I mean, I agree. I mean, you know, me having three sons, so, you know, my oldest son, Jameer, um, he, he's like on the autistic spectrum. And, you know, mm -hmm. what that means for me is that he soaks up nothing but information, <laughs> you know. And one of the questions that he asks is me when we drive in the morning to, to work and to school He's like, Daddy, I want to listen to Panda. I want to listen mm -hmm. to Panda. I want to listen to Panda. <laughs> so I said, draw me a Panda. He couldn't do it, you know? But he knew exactly what that song was and all of the lyrics to it and things of that nature. But, you know, I kind of put the blame on myself because that's what I put on when I'm taking him to school. Mm -hmm. So I also think that, yeah, music plays a major part in it. But I think as parents and as adults that we should do a better job of censoring that from these young people until they're ready of age, mm -hmm. you know, um, my aunt had all the Dougie Fresh tapes and Slick Rick tapes and yeah, things I'm like. Too young for that. <laughs> I haven't. I didn't even see that she owned those things till I was like 16 years old. Mm. You know what I mean? Because they did a good job of keeping that stuff away from me. All the thing I knew about was watching Alf, and I know I'm showing my age and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, you are. It's <laughs> all so good. But I mean, that's that's what I think we should do. You know, when when young kids are having kids, how can you tell a 17 year old to censor the music that they're showing to? their one-year-old baby when they haven't even matured yet. Um, do you think like parents could be more stern or less stern to their children? Yeah, I feel like parents need to buckle down. Like I always hear this from my mother. Back in my day, there was no talking back. Da -da -da. So yeah, so like, you know, but then that also comes with the law. Like a lot of parents out here are scared to discipline their kids because they feel like, oh, ACS is gonna get in the picture, the law, the courts. They don't have time for that. Nobody has time for that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so, you know, these kids are getting wilder because they know that they can get away with more nowadays. Mm -hmm. Have a balance, maybe not, maybe actually speak to your children. I mean, I, I've never been hit or spanked in a day in my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. Look at your face. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I was just always taught to my mom, and there were things I didn't listen to growing up. When I told her I liked rap, she had me listen to, like, Black Eyed Peas. So, damn. Yeah. <laughs> I thought Usher was a rapper, bro. That's how bad it was. <laughs> and then after a while, things were shown to me, but censored. Like, mm -hmm. Eminem was censored when I was, like, nine. Mm. You know? Right. So maybe show them the rap you listen to, but had the clean version. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. You know? I got you. I got you. Um, do y'all think it's easy for young kids to get guns nowadays? I think it's easier for them to get those than get jobs. Yeah, and that's crazy. You know, um, from like I said, so like I'm a dean of students, and I've been working at Youth Build East Harlem for 12 years, mm -hmm. and I was actually a participant in Youth Build East Harlem, so mm -hmm. I had got my GED from there, never left, and it's easier for a young person to come to me and say, hey, Mike, I can get access to a gun, than a young person say, hey, Mike, I can get access to a job, mm -hmm. you know, um, and I think that's one of the bigger problems that we have, too. You know, we have all of these resources and all of this money coming into our city, but yet and still, you only offer jobs for our young people during the summertime? Why do you only have summer youth? Why you don't have winter youth and fall youth and all year youth? Mm -hmm. Why you don't, and like, you know, the program that I represent, it's an earn to learn program where these young people get a stipend while they're still in school. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't you think that it's in a good investment to invest in them now so that mm -hmm. later on we're not paying for that? You know, the price that it costs to give a young person a summer job internship and a check that's like one fourth of the cost of locking a young person up you know what i mean and even when they get locked up you took away ged classes you took away people going to college so they can't educate themselves and i know it sounds petty but you even took away some of the sedatives that keep people sane in jail like people can't even smoke a cigarette in jail no more mm. 
So now you're sitting there full of stress. You can't learn. You can't educate yourself. You can't build yourself up. You can't smoke a cigarette to kind of calm yourself down. And then you got a young person that comes to jail or get arrested. They put medication on them. They, you know, mental health is another huge issue that we should talk about because, mm -hmm. you know, young people are dealing with trauma. Um, nobody's going to Wagner Houses or Jefferson saying, hey, your 16-year-old classmate got shot in the head. Do you have somebody you want to talk to? You know, and what do you think that ha happens to that 16-year-old when he turns 22? He's still dealing with the trauma of seeing his friend in the box, but nobody wants to talk about that. But, you know, the first time a young person says that they're losing it, oh, you didn't grow up yet. What do you know about losing it? You're just a kid. You're just a young person. You ain't paying no bills. You ain't doing that. And then this young person turns into a shooter mm -hmm. because we ignored it. So that's my you think it's easy. He's said everything I was going to say. So, Jude? <laughs> I feel like people, I feel like they're probably a little afraid to go to um, therapy if they need it. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes, I mean, it might be blatant for me to say it, but you have to take initiative, like, yo, this is really messed up. I need mm -hmm. some help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, people are afraid to go and ask for help. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's because of the reputations that they get from their peers? Like, they'd be scared to, like, oh, yeah. like, like yeah, oh, you were worse or yeah, like like that. They, they I mean, there is the there is confidentiality between a guidance counselor and you know the patient. Mm -hmm. You know, so trust in that you're not snitching, mm -hmm. or whatever. You're not going to the cop. You know, and I think it's better to just go get some help, and someone asking you for help is <laughs> besides someone asking you what you're gonna do about it. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's too more of um, the people that do that work. Like, I have no interest in going to speak to Miss White that lives in New Rochelle, New York, driving in her Lexus while I'm taking the six train home from work and got mugged yesterday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have no idea what I'm going through. You mm -hmm. want to relate to somebody. I want to relate. So I think that what makes, like, our program work is, like, yeah, I'm their dean and they respect me, but I have to hold myself to a higher level of accountability because we shop in the same supermarkets. Mm -hmm. We shop in the same places. I can't tell Aaron's mom that he's going to get his high school diploma and be a better young person and not lie and I run into Aaron and his mom's in Target on 116th Street I'm going <laughs> to have a problem you know what I mean so it's like I think when we have more caring older adults that live in the community and have a stake in it outcomes would be different um, that shooter will put his gun away when he see Miss Brown crossing across the street that shooter's not going to put his gun away when Miss Fields from upstate is walking by. We don't care about you. We don't know. We don't know who you are. We don't care. Mm -hmm. But we care about the lady that watched us grow up, babysit us when we was kids, or look after my mom, or look after my sister. But I think we're doing it wrong. Um, we was talking about it recently. Tenant Patrol <laughs> is leaving the project. Surveillance cameras are coming in, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and nobody's saying nothing about it. That's them. not even fast enough to respond. Nope. 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 To anything. Nope. You know, and you know. Young people aren't getting employed. They do some of youth jobs, but there's no carryover into that. Mm -hmm. You know, if you do a good job here in this summer, why can't the supervisor say, I want to invest in this young person for the fall? Mm -hmm. And why can't the city say, you know what, that's a good investment so that when this young person gets out of school, they can come here and learn a trade. You know, um, the fact that this place ain't publicized enough in the community that people don't really know about it. Like, mm -hmm. the skills you guys are doing is, something that can be carried on to a whole bunch of different professions. And y'all learning they're young, mm -hmm. you know, but why is not five or six of these places all over the community popped up, you know what I mean? And it, these are the problems that we need to deal with.